listening to Harrismith Radio, Episode 9. Hey there, I'm your host, Wayne McPhail. In this episode, we go from the fire into the soup pot, literally, well, almost. I start with a sobering conversation with science writer Vanessa Farnsworth about the wildfires that have ravaged the West Coast, including, most recently, California. We talk about how human-induced climate change has a lot to answer for, and what we can all do to fight the fires, or their consequences, anyway. Next, into the soup. Soup bread of compost and stone. You'll see. By the way, if you want to read Harrismith magazine instead of listen to it, you can subscribe to the print version online at harrismithmagazine.com. And you can find Harrismith magazine on selected newsstands across Canada. But for now, settle in for the next half hour of Harrismith Radio. A study published in Earth's Future last year is clear. The fires that ravaged BC in 2017 were made terrifyingly worse by the human-induced climate change we've caused. We've made weather horrendous, whipping up winds, calling down lightning, and causing the fires to burn up to 11 times more land than normal. And things might get worse still. To understand what's at stake and what we can do about it, I spoke with a Western voice of reason and a Harrismith Magazine contributor, Vanessa Farnsworth. Things get dark, but we offer hope, so hang in there. Hey Vanessa, thanks for joining us all the way from Vancouver. Uh, no problem. Now, speaking of Vancouver, you guys, we're, we're going to be talking about the effects of climate change on and extreme weather on wildfires in British Columbia. But, you know, when I look at the stats this past season, it hasn't been so bad for you guys. You're, it's not exactly like you're in California or you're in Fort McMurray. It's been pretty good. So why is there and why should that we be concerned about wildfires uh, in British Columbia and the effect of climate change on those wildfires if you had a pretty good season? Well, the reason why we need to be concerned is that that was just one single season. If you look back on the recent history of wildfires in BC, you'll see that we had a significant problem in 2016. And, you know, that was bad enough for those of us who live in British Columbia, who spent several weeks breathing smoke. But then 2017 came along and that was record breaking, even record shattering wildfire season in terms of the number of hectares that were burnt. And then 2018 came along and that was even worse than 2017. So if we look at 2019, what we had this summer, we can say, well, that wasn't so bad. So maybe the crisis has passed, but that's not actually the way it's going to work. When you look at the projections of what impact that human caused climate change are going to have over the future, those projections don't don't focus in on what's going to happen from one year to the next. They look at the overall trend. And the overall trend that we're starting to see in British Columbia, and that is going to be more and more evident as years go by, is that it's going to be increasingly worse. So we're going to look at hotter temperatures. We're going to look at droughty uh, summers to an cre- increasing degree. And that is going to cause the perfect storm that is going to result in these increasing fire seasons. So even though 2019 wasn't so bad, that may in the long run turn out to be an anomaly. Right. So let's let's go back to 2017. And, and I was being facetious about the fact we shouldn't worry because I know we should worry. But it just it's, it's an interesting moment that, you know, we're talking about this now when there was a lull. So, it, you know, and it, it just indicates that, you know, these sort of uh, seasonal or yearly variations really don't have any impact when you're looking at a much broader range for things like climate change and impact on on wildfires. So let's go back to 2017, because there's some really interesting numbers. You talked about the the amount that was burned and the amount is pretty amazing like it's like 12,160 square kilometers were burned and i think what's really interesting about that and i, I know you you know about the study that was published in earth futures that looked at that 2017 season and the significant thing there touching on what you just talked about was that they determined with like 95% certainty that the, the human induced climate change 
was completely responsible for that dramatic increase and that the amount, the, the 7 to 11 times more than usual burn rate. Does that concern you? Oh, definitely. That's very concerning. You know, it makes you wonder, you know, if we keep going the way we are going, just how bad is this thing going to get? Because when you just look uh, in terms of just the numbers since 1900. If you look at just the period between 1900 and 2013 in British Columbia, the average temperature warmed by almost 1.5 degrees Celsius. If you look at what the projections are for what temperature is going to be by 2050 in British Columbia, we're looking at a further 2.7 degrees Celsius increase. Um, so if you look at what we've, we've had in terms of fire seasons, 2016, 2017, 2018, yeah, we got a bit of a reprieve in 2019, but the higher those temperatures go and the faster those temperatures get there and the rate at which uh, those temperatures are going up is increasing, we've got a really big problem because our forests are gonna dry out and they are just going to be one big tinderbox. Right. So we talked about the, the temperatures resulting in the forest drying out. What other thing? I mean, it, it seems like you're using the temperature as a proxy of concern, right? Yeah. So what other things happen when temperature rises relative to wildfires? Well, one of the things that happens is that it's sort of predicted in the future that precipitation levels in British Columbia, we've already seen them increase. Um, we're going to continue to see them increase, but there's this strange thing that happens. We're going to see the summers get much drier. So it's not just the fact that the temperatures are going to go up, it's the fact that we're going to get much drier summers. And when you have these stressed forests, these forests that consistently are going through these drought seasons, uh, which weakens the plants, which allows insects to get in there. What you're looking at is you've got weakened plants, you've got drought conditions, you've got increased temperatures. All you need is one lightning strike and one lightning strike can then turn around and take out thousands of hectares. One of the things, you know, that is a danger there is if you have, uh, paradoxically, a situation like you have in, in the BC area of not having a lot of wildfires, that's actually not a good thing for the next season, right? Because you've got this buildup of dry material, of forest cover of duff that's just sitting there waiting to, to burn, right? Right. And we have no shortage of forest in British Columbia. And so that's what we're actually seeing is this accumulation of basically just tinder. It's just this low-lying vegetation that we have sweeping through our forest. And in some places, the forests are so thick that you can't even walk through them. And the more accumulation we get of that kind of debris, the low-growing plant material, the kind of debris that's just accumulating over decades, the more you get of that, the greater the problems you are if you get a lightning strike. So in a forest that is fairly cleared, and that's what you know they try to do in the forests that are tended, uh, tended around here, is they try to clear out a lot of that low-lying brush, a lot of that debris. And so if you get a fire start there, there's nothing for the fire to do because it can't really burn the bark of these trees very well. And it just basically burns itself out. But if you have this accumulation of debris and, and low-lying plants very thickly in these forests, what happens is you get a lightning strike and then it just takes off. And one of the things I was reading about recently, which is really alarming, is too, in terms of lightning strikes and in terms of, of wildfire starting, and having that fuel, that they're also finding as the temperature increases, it generally fires often will will die down a bit in the evening, right? Because the, the uh, humidity increases, it's not as hot. But what they've been finding lately is because of the increased temperature, the fires are actually burning at a regular rate all through the day and night, which is really frightening for firefighters. Yeah, and to make things worse, uh, wildfires, when you get these really bad ones, is they cre can create their own weather. And so not only do you have um, the fire burning and not cooling down over the nights, but you have it so that it's generating wind and it's generating conditions that are just going to cause the wildfire to, to get worse and to cover more territory. 
territory makes it much more difficult to fight a fire like that. We spend a lot of times in BC when we have a wildfire in our areas, just crossing our fingers for two things, that we get cool night temperatures, cool enough that we'll get that under control, and we pray for rain, a lot of rain, because just a sprinkle won't help. And unfortunately, with the types of summers that we've been seeing in recent years, we often don't get those cool temperatures at night, um, and we often don't get the kind of precipitation. We get drought conditions, and we've got a wildfire burning in a drought condition. It is extremely difficult to control. So we're talking a little bit about vicious circles, right? That you've got a situation mm-hmm. where you've got a wildfire that's burning out of control that's creating this wild weather. I think they're called pyrocumulonimbus clouds, these things that can produce right. these, these incredible winds and, and lightning. So it's then that increases the chance of lightning strikes and the wind in, enhances the fire. So you've just got this thing that's just feeding on itself and making itself worse and worse over the short term of or the longer term of a wildfire. But there's also sort of vicious cycles that are happening on a, a broader basis around the the wildfires. And I'm thinking, for for example, about carbon sequestering. Can we talk a bit about that and, and how that's sort of been turned on its head by wildfires? Well, yes, because carbon sequestering is something that we're having significant issues with because when we're seeing these massive uh, tracts of land burnt, and I think in 2017 it was 1.2 million hectares, all of those trees, every single tree is a carbon sink. And it's uh, sequestering carbon that would otherwise be in the atmosphere, out in the environment. And as we know, when we're talking about human-caused climate change, carbon plays a big role in that. So when you're seeing these massive millions of acres burning down, you're not just burning down trees, you're burning down carbon sinks and you're releasing a huge amount of carbon back into the atmosphere. And that only makes the future scarier because we're actually not just uh, in terms of the local, but we're putting more carbon back out into the atmosphere, and that's only going to make the, the possibility of wildfires increase. So I think it's really important just to pause for a second and break that down a bit so that, that, that folks that may not be that familiar with the idea of, of what's happening with carbon is we've got these plants, these trees, the shrubbery, these peat mosses that are or have pulled carbon out of the atmosphere uh, through uh, transpiration and carbon dioxide, you know, the photosynthesis process is, is processing that stuff and pulling it out and producing oxygen. So it's holding that carbon dioxide that is uh, part of the problem for climate change in themselves. And when they decay and stay in the earth, uh, particularly in the case of something like a, a wetland or a peat bog, that's keeping that carbon out of the atmosphere, right? Yes, that's correct. And one of the things that, again, it's sort of a vicious cycle. If we look at what's happening, for example, with peat bogs, and peat's used in a lot of fires, like in Ireland and stuff, it was a, a staple for, for burning. You've got climate change that is exposing more of the peat moss that's available to catch on fire, right? So again, it's another vicious cycle that we're facing here. Yeah, it is an extraordinarily complicated problem problem because as you say it's not just the one thing is that each one of these factors impacts something else and pretty much universally in a negative way that pretty much guarantees that the problem is going to get worse over time and not better so we get these these little tiny reprieves so we can all breathe better that 2019 did not go the way 2017 and 2018 went, where we had a record-breaking year followed by a record-breaking year. And I think a lot of us were extremely concerned in BC that 2019 was going to turn into yet another record-breaker. So it's nice that that didn't happen, but it doesn't take too much to realize that the conditions that are going to make this fire seasons in the future get worse and worse and worse, they're already out there in nature right now, and they're just compounding every time that we have one of these these really bad fire seasons. Now, are folks out there being complacent because it was uh, not a, a bad season, or are they, like you, sort of thinking we're heading towards a perfect storm in 2020, 2021? Uh, well, we're thinking that we're heading towards a perfect storm, so there's a lot of thought being put into what can we do as individuals and communities to mitigate this, because you do get this sense, particularly 
particularly when we talk about something as big as climate change, you get this sense that you're completely powerless. You can see what the prediction models are. You can see that we are in the path of these wildfires, that they're going to increase every year. And so as just an individual, you tend to feel like you have no power in this situation. It's going to happen and there's nothing you can do about it. But, you know, that, that's not necessarily true. And there are programs like the Fire Smart Program, which helps people to mitigate the fire risk on their own property so that even if a wildfire does strike through your region, there's a very good chance that your own property and your own possessions are going to survive. Yeah, I think there was some really interesting studies looking at where wildfires were curtailed by firefighters. And yet in communities, fires were breaking out beyond that boundary because embers yeah. from the fires were actually getting into people's eaves troughs and dried trees in their backyard that were suddenly catching fire. So it was propagating because beyond the fire boundary because of these hot embers that had fuel within the boundaries of somebody's property, right? Oh, and sure. And we saw that very much in the campfire that happened in California. And we saw that in Fort McMurray as well. Um, there's some great footage on the uh, internet on YouTube from both both of those fires, but it shows that once it hit a community, it stopped being a wildfire and started to be mass structural fires. And that's because of the conditions that existed in those communities, that those properties, they had maybe they had a lot of conifer trees, they had a lot of vegetation pushed up against houses, um, they had bark chips around their houses, they had all these, these situations that made it so that once the fire embers started to blow from from the wilderness into the communities, that they were setting fire to what was actually in, in suburban yards. And those were in turn setting fire to the houses. And so you had something that switched from a wildfire to structural fires. And there's no chance in a situation like that, that fire services would be able to go to every individual structure and put those fires out. So really, it's something that individuals and individual homeowners need to take care of on their own, which is to, to mitigate their risk. And you can do this in as little as an afternoon, just you you get that uh, fire smart pamphlet, which tells you how to do it, you walk around your house and you say, is there anything growing here that would actually increase my chances of uh, my house burning down if an ember were to blow into this situation. And, you know, you just selectively remove plants there problematic. You replace uh, conifer plants with deciduous. There's a lot of things you can do so that even if a wildfire sweeps into your neighborhood, there's a pretty good chance that your house is going to stay standing. It's a little ironic, isn't it, that, you know, we wanted to have our properties look like nature and bring trees and bring birds to our backyards. And in some ways now that's turning into being not such a good thing. Well, yeah, vacant lot's not going to burn, right? Um, what's going to burn is the houses with all the, the landscaping. And really, it's not that you can't landscape your own property. We would never say that to anybody. But it's what you're landscaping with and how you're landscaping um, and how you're caring for the trees that are there. So if you do have large conifers, large old conifers, just doing something as simple as removing the bottom six feet of branches is going to be something that is going to dramatically decrease the chance that you're going to have a problem on your property. So it's not so much that we're landscaping that's the problem, it's that we're landscaping in a way that increases our risk. And if we just learn the basics, we can landscape in a way that decreases our risk. All of that, that saves property and hopefully yep. saves lives, but it doesn't make any difference to the forest themselves. No, right? no, exactly. So, so are you feeling, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's been a fair, fairly depressing conversation uh, without, apart from <laughs> what people can do to, to save their, their, their own property. So are you feeling pessimistic or optimistic about the direction things are going to be moving in in the next few years? I'm feeling as though if we make the right decisions, we can take things in a positive way. I'm not 100% sure we're moving in that direction right now. So we know when we're talking about carbon sequestering, um, planting a whole lot of trees is the best way that we have that we can actually mitigate some of this climate change. Um, if every single Canadian were to go out and plant one tree, we have how many people living in Canada now? 30 million plus, that's 30 million trees. If we got programs going on a, on a public level, on public lands, planting a lot of trees, that would be very helpful. You know, one of the problems we have here in B.C. is we're burning down our forests so much faster than we can replant them. So in B.C., just replanting what's burned is 
almost an impossible task, but if we were to commit to doing that, we could actually make a significant difference. And if all Canadians, the federal government, and provincial gov- provincial governments, um, got into the got into the program where they just say we're going to commit to to planting, you know, 10 million trees a year for the indefinite future, then we can actually have more of an impact than we tend to think we have when we're feeling helpless. Well, thank you very much for for sharing your insights about wildfires and climate change. And I I do hope that uh, 2020 doesn't turn out to be a a perfect storm or maybe a a perfect storm of solution, but not a perfect storm of fires. Oh, hey, we're all hoping that. Thank you very much, Vanessa. You're welcome. That was Vanessa Farnsworth, who is cleaning her gutters and planting trees as we speak, no doubt. How do you make soup from compost and a stone? Well, you don't really, but the Compost Council of Canada was inspired by the fable of stone... How do you make soup from compost and a stone? Well, you don't really, but the Compost Council of Canada was inspired by the fable of stone soup to fund their Plant, Grow, Share a Row program by hosting Soupalicious, a celebration of the Earth's bounty and humans' desire to share. I spoke with Susan Antler of the Compost Council about the origins and intents of the... I spoke with Susan Antler about... I spoke with Susan Antler of the Compost Council about the origins and intents of the delicious event. So, Susan, thanks very much for joining us. I want to talk about Soupalicious, but this story really starts not with soup, but with compost. So give me a little bit of background on how you go from compost to delicious soup. The Compost Council of Canada, which is where I work, is a, a program, a nonprofit organization that is focused on encouraging everyone to respect the organic materials that are no longer useful in kitchen or in the garden and to return them back to the soil through the process of composting and anaerobic digestion. In the uh, late 1990s, we formed a partnership with the Garden Writers Association and local food banks to promote a program which is now called Plant Growth. Share a row. And it's a, a program which encourages folks to think about the food banks and neighbors in need when the harvests come in. And you can plant an extra row at the beginning, or when the harvest comes in, there's always extras, and to share those extras with neighbors in need. Right. And that started out in Winnipeg, right? It started in the Canadian program, started in Winnipeg in, in the mid 1980s. And then, you know, like a good idea, it happens other places as well. And so the United States started a similar program with the same concept in the mid-90s. And when we got about putting the program together, you know, quite honestly, you don't want to compete. And it gets into the issue of people are hungry, let's put all our resources together. And so it came about that it's Plant, Grow, Share, Row. And it's really, as I understand it, Plant, Grow, Share, a Row, but we don't have any dough, right? So you needed to find a way to fund that program, right? Exactly. Yeah, we have well over 100. The program has gone, you know, when we first started, many of the conversations were no, 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 we can't do it. And uh, over time, not only do we have formal programs that are through the Plant, Grow, Share, a Row, but basically the whole concept of, of sharing extras and fresh produce with local food banks when they can accept them and when they have the ability to get them to uh, folks in need in a timely manner. Um, th- that That is now expanded everywhere. And the program is not funded. So, you know, we're a pretty resourceful little group and thought that we would develop a program called Soupalicious. And it came from the idea of stone soup, where everyone brings something to the party. They bring their time, their talents, their creativity. And together, you create a great soup. So tell me what that experience is like for folks. Soupalicious is the most amazing community event I've ever been to. It's just like soup. It's warm. It's inviting. It's an enjoyable experience all the way through. What happens, and it depends on the local community, but basically uh, chefs from the neighborhood, from the area where it's being held, will come and bring one of their specialty soups. And it could be a vegan soup, it could be vegetarian, it could be a meat lover soup. It's really up to the chef. And there's an entrance fee. We try to keep it very modest. 
uh, because we want to make it, uh, this event very accessible. And then you come in and uh, you get to sip, slurp, and savor these delicious soups. What happens also is uh, it's a scientific phenomena that we have that soup circles are happening there. I know when we first started the program, we thought people would just come for the soup and then leave. But usually people come in a group with friends, family, and they go and try one soup and then they they all discuss it in a little soup circle and then they move on to the next. And by the end, you've had a really great experience and a full belly and um, it's good for the community. And there's a Harrismith connection here too, right? That Harrismith has created a signature soup for Soupalicious, right? Yeah, we're, we're so fortunate. I mean, Harrow Smith is, embodies, embodies a local, fresh community, environmental sustainability. And so we're thrilled to have a partnership with Harrow Smith, who uh, not only uh, gives the network of awareness, but also creates a soup. And uh, this year, it, it, we've had this, uh, this relationship for a number of years. This year, we had this spectacular soup that had uh, smoked trout and grilled corn and chive sour cream. And it was just just phenomenal. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And thank you very much for uh, not only sharing a role, but sharing the time with us today to talk about Soupalicious and uh, where it came from, uh, its, its roots in compost. Thank you very much. Thank you for your support. That was Susan Antler, who has successfully gotten soup from a stone. So here we are at the end of this episode of Harris Smith Radio. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider subscribing to this podcast on Apple iTunes or in your favorite podcast player. And please tell your friends and family. Got feedback? We'd love to hear it. You can email us at letters at harrismithmag.com. That URL, harrowsmithmag.com, is also where you can order subscriptions online. And you can find Harrowsmith Magazine on selected newsstands across Canada. Until next time, for Harrowsmith Radio, I'm Wayne McPhail. And also, until next time, remember these four words. Make, grow, sustain, share. Tune in for the next episode of Harrowsmith Radio.